let me ask you a question. Do you find e4, e5 a very difficult move to beat? Well, I'm Grandmaster Max Lingworth, and the good news is, you're not alone. You see, the most annoying system for Yana Pomnishi to face was not the Sicilian, it wasn't the French, and it wasn't the Bon Cloud, but in his match in 2021 World Championship against Magnus Carlsen, the line that stopped him winning any games with the white pieces was a line known as the Marshal, and I'm not referring to the Fire Marshal with the guns and all, rather I'm referring to the Marshal Gambit. It's a line of the Roy Lopez, Bishop b5, where black goes a6, Bishop a4, Knight to f6, castles. This is all mainline theory, of course there are many alternatives for both sides at these points, but these moves have been played many, many times for many, many years. And typically White's plan in these lines is to go C3, D4, and take over the center, yeah? And perhaps a plan B, this B5 pawn can also be a little bit weak. But rather than falling into this with something like D6 and you know, a position like this, is kind of thought to be slightly better for White in, uh, in most of the lines, say Knight A5. This is the old school way of playing the Royal Lopez's Black, Chigger in variation, get the center, but... You know, your knight is a little bit offside on a5, and white does get a small advantage, according to the theory. Yes or yes. So, instead of that, we have the move castles in this position. And castles is known as the marshal, with the idea that if you play the same idea that we saw worked very well against d6 in the move c3, well, black is he's not going to push the pawn one square, he's going to push it two squares forward. This is the starting position of the Marshal Gambit, and in the games that we're going to see in this video, I'm going to show you a way to avoid this Gambit, but to understand why we avoid it, it's because after ED5, on the one hand, yes, you are up a pawn, and if you're up a pawn in the ending, normally it's a win, yes or yes. But the Marshal's a little bit different, because after C6, Black has got this very fast piece play. So if you play D4, they go Bishop to D6, hit the Rook, and then danger levels, queen to h4, attacking this pawn, kind of forcing us to weaken our king with g3, and suddenly look at this. The bishop is coming in the attack, the rook is coming in the attack, the pawn even is coming into the attack as well. And white, well look at this, all of his pieces on the queen side are still on their starting squares. And because white is so far behind development, that gives black the time to get his attack going, to have that continual initiative, you may remember the initiative is like having the ball in, what's the word? In football, thank you very much. And so, rather than letting the opponent possess the ball and kick us around like a soccer ball, instead, let's do a little bit of the kicking ourselves. And before I share with you the secret weapon that only has been played in the last three years, starting in 2018, but has been used to take down many of the world's top grandmasters, like Levon Aronian, Ding Liren, and many others, I will share that with you, but first remember to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to the channel. It's the red subscribe button. And I also want to share with you Nepo, that is Ian Nepomnishi's failed attempts to beat Carlsen in the World Championship match. You see, Nepo, Nepom didn't play the line that, uh, that I'm going to show you. Instead, he played this Annie Marshall of H3 in Game 1. And then Carlsen said, you know what, I'm going to sack a pawn anyway, and played knight a5 and got very similar martial style compensation to the game, which actually, or to the, the normal martial line we saw before, yeah? So that's something actually I have a suggested video as well. You can click the card and that will take you to this idea that I covered in game one very briefly. But let's move forward and see also the other move Nepon played was the move a4. This is kind of the main line of the the anti marshal the anti marshal being the lines where we make it very hard for black to get in a good d5 move yeah and to open the center for his pieces so by playing e a4 the idea is that we say well whichever way you defend against the threat of a b5 you're making a little bit of a concession carlson actually in the match he had a couple of games where he played rook to b8 saying well i'm going to give up the file but it's not that big of a deal still the position is very solid I mean, white is a tiny bit better with c3 and d4 kind of ideas, but Carlson was able to neutralize it quite well and to draw all of the games. There's also the move bishop b7 that Carlson played in one game, which 
At first, it might seem a little bit imprecise, because d3 does kill the bishop, yeah? But it's also very solid for black, and also in the match, Carson kind of showed that with his plan like rook e8, and just, you know, maneuvering the pieces harmoniously, that he was able to gradually maintain the balance here as well. And then there's also the main move b4, which kind of gives some different ideas, where you can either push with d4, and try to, you know, have some small initiative in the center. Or you can play a move like a5 and then play d3 and aim for a much more positional game. And actually, this is a line I have recommended in the past in an article I wrote for 50 Moves magazine about two or three years ago. But nowadays, it's again, even though Carlson has won some games with white, it's nothing too special if Black knows what he's doing. So here we can sort of see that, you know, this is not going to be the video where we prove that White has a forced win in the Marshall and Black should just resign already after our next move. But it's a way in which we can set some problems. We can ask some tricky questions. And unless your opponent is a top theoretician like me, it's unlikely they're going to be well prepared for it. So the answer is the move D3. This is the move I'm recommending in this video, beating the Marshall. But I think you'll agree it's good to see how some of the other alternatives play out so that we know why we're not playing a more common move. Yes or yes? Because maybe you'll decide I want to play the Marshall with Black after seeing Carlson play it. So what's the idea of D3? Well, the idea of D3 is that they will play the move D6. Uh, important point is D5 is a lot less effective. What the reason you think that D5 is less effective and that this position is much better for White with the pawn on D3 rather than the pawn on C3? Well, the answer is that you have the ability to bring your knight to a much more active square, like knight here, and you can also develop your pieces much faster. What really makes a martial gambit work is the fact that c3 was played and, and that black white doesn't have any good squares for the knight, yeah? So this is just not, not the same, yeah? But instead, of course, black can play d6, and here is where we plant our big surprise and get the opponent scratching their heads, wondering if we made a mouse slip or not. Because in this position, let's say you play some typical Lopez move, like h3, for example, uh, you know, stopping bishop g4. Well, what you're trying to avoid in the Royal Lopez is you don't want to have your bishop get traded for a knight, because then you lose the bishop pair and you lose that very powerful Lopez pressure down the long diagonal. And with knight a5, black would actually already be a little bit better, in my opinion, because of the bishop pair and having a very strong center with c5. So, that explains the idea of Caruana's move that he played. Should we call this a Caruana variation? Maybe, because he was the first strong GM to play this move of bishop to d2. And the idea of bishop d2 is to stop knight a5 don't know, winning our bishop on b3, but there are some other ideas as well. And to help you understand these ideas, I'm going to share with you this game that was played in the Candidates Tournament of 2018. If you're wondering how Caruana got to play the World Championship match against Magnus Carlsen in 2018. The way he did it was by winning the Candidates Tournament. And he was doing really great in this event. He was just running away with the tournament, playing much better than all the other players. But then, in round 12, much like Magnus Carlsen in 2013, actually, disaster struck for Caruana. He lost in the black side of a Petrov against Sergei Kayakin. And suddenly, the score was tied. But where, if... Kayakin had the same score as Caruana. Kayakin had the better tie break because Kayakin had beaten Caruana in that individual encounter, true or true. So Caruana had to pull out the win with White against Lev Onoroni in the next game. And that's the game we're going to look at here from round 13 of the candidates. So in this game, Aronian played a move Bishop G4, which is indeed the strongest move in this position. Uh, there are a few other moves that Black can play, saying, well, I don't care that you allow me to pin the knight with bishop g4. Uh, well, for example, what if black were to play something like bishop to b7? That strikes me as being the most natural alternative, because if you play some random move, let's say you play, I don't know, king h8 or something, just as a pass move to show the ideas, well, white can go h3 and suddenly, you know, this bishop doesn't have this square, and we also have ideas to play a4 and still attack the pawn, kind of like we saw in uh, a bit earlier in the video, yes or yes. And also we keep the option to play knight c3 and put our knight on d5 for a more central strategy, where we also can play c3, d4 as a middle game plan and put some pressure in the center, but only playing c3 and d4 when our b1 knight is already very strong in that center. So that's what white is aiming for on a general level. 
And actually, I believe this also actually happened in the game in uh, in the candidates in 2018. I think in the the very next round, actually, after Caruana played, funnily enough, if I remember correctly. But also, if they do play bishop b7 and play it more like a Zaitsev system, bishop b7, rook e8, well, then you can play a4, and you've actually move ordered your opponent a little bit into a different line of the Annie Marshall, where Black's played bishop b7. Uh, just to help you make sense of it, if we go back to the position on move 7, and we consider a4, bishop b7, d3, and d6, as happened in one of the Carlson Nepo games, well, bishop d2 is actually probably one of White's best moves here anyway to stop knight a5. And it's the position that we would transpose to with our move order of bishop b7 and a4. So it's a little move order trick where, say, if, you know, black wanted to play 8 rook b8 or 8 b4 against a4, well, we force them into 8 bishop b7 line that perhaps is not in their normal repertoire. So this is a little move order trick that can give you that unfair advantage against your opponents. Also, I have a link in the description, by the way, if you do want to get your unfair advantage against your next chess opponents, uh, not just in the martial, but just in general. In any case, let's continue with how the actual game played out. Uh, well, before I do, actually, I will point out that black should probably play b4 to stop our knight coming out, but you can still play c3, you're still challenging the center in, I mean, this sort of position, after, say, b takes c3 and bishop takes. I mean, you're going to get in some d4 break, and that's going to give you decent chances for an advantage. Of course, black can... Try to play a little bit differently as well. But if they go a5 trying to keep our knight trapped in, well, we can play even a move like d4 and still take the center, and that does give us decent chances for an edge as well. In any case, the game instead saw the move bishop to g4. And after bishop to g4, white's idea is that you don't want to allow black just trade off a lot of pieces, so white plays the move c3. And actually, this is a very deep strategic point, a Grandmaster secret that I'll share with you here. Because you might be wondering, well, why is it that White is fighting for an advantage in general in the closed Roy Lopez? And the main reason is because the knight on c6 is a little bit misplaced in these structures. The fact is that the pawn on c3 just does a very good job of doing the distance for, of not allowing the knight to advance further. And also, we see that this b5 is a little weakening. We've seen many times how a4 has been a way to try to chip away at that pawn. So the move that black should probably play is the move knight a5, and we're actually going to see it in the second game that I will be sharing with you in this video. But before I do, I want to show you how Caruana beat Aronian in the Canis tournament, because this was one of the best games of the whole tournament, and I think you'll agree when we finish, it was an absolute masterpiece by the then world number two, Fabiano Caruana. Actually, Caruana has been the world number two for many years, but very recently, Ferrucia overtook him on the ratings, yeah? But the idea of d5 is to kind of play a little bit in this sort of martial kind of spirit, yeah? Where, you know, if white plays ed5 and takes, then you don't have knight takes e5 because of the pin, true or true. So instead, white goes h3, he puts that question to the bishop, and it's a pretty well-known principle in the Royal Lopez that you don't want to give up the bishop for the knight, because then this bishop is very strong as an unopposed piece. So black keeps the pin with bishop to h5. And now a little move that was actually a novelty at the time by Caruana. He played this move of queen to e2. Just keeping the tension in the position and saying, well, okay, you've got your pawn on d5, but what is your follow-up here? And it's actually a good question. What move would you play in black shoes to try to deal with white's plan? And the reason I ask you this is because I think that when you're considering your opening that you want to play, don't just think about what are my plans from my side, but it's also good to think, well, what is the opponent trying to do as well, yeah? And also what you're going to find when you ask the question, what would I do if I was in my opponent's shoes? What will often happen is you'll make some typical mistake that makes your idea work really well, yes or yes. And then you realize, oh, so it's not as simple as the engine saying zero, zero, zero. If I can mess up the position playing as my own weapon, then there's a good chance my opponents will also mess up in a game, yes or yes. So at this point, uh, Aronian played this move of rook to b8, which at first glance might seem like a very curious move in the position, but there is actually a certain logic behind the move rook to b8, in that, well, it's kind of like a very deep prophylactic move, where let's say, for example, if black were to play a move like d4, uh, which by the way is also a suggestion of the computer here, well, in this case, often the plan with d4 is to play d take c3, play b4, and then try to get the knight to d4. 
Uh, let's say I just play, I know, some random move like uh, King H1 just to, to show the idea. Then so yeah, it makes a big difference having this, uh, you know, the Rook on B8 to support the to support the pawn. So you can go Knight D4 and then take and, and all this sort of thing. That's kind of like the, the basic sort of idea, I guess, of Rook B8. Probably there are some deeper points as well that you could also maybe lift the Rook over in some cases. But yeah, I mean, after D4, this can get quite sharp, but it will also have activated the position for the Bishop. And I realize I have drawn my own Picasso painting with a million arrows, so perhaps I can show you the way that the game played instead with the move Rook to B8. Uh, but D4 is certainly the main alternative and one that, if you're a top theoretician, you'll probably want to analyze it deeply, but most of you guys, well, are not burning the Midnight Oil trying to prove a plus 0 0.01 advantage the way that Carlson Seconds did for the match. So after Rook B8, Carolina moves the Bishop, but to which square does he move the Bishop? You could actually make an argument for both bishop c1 and bishop g5, but for a human perspective, bishop g5 is a lot more active, and I think the better move as well. And then anyway, bishop g5 is also that in some positions you may be able to, for example, play g4 and make their bishop a very bad piece. And if I am not mistaken, it's an idea we may also even see in the in the game, in fact. Well, not an exact version, but sort of it's a, a point that comes up a lot that let's say if we were to make some some pass move for black, because uh, in the game black played d takes e4 and released the tension in the center, but if instead they play a move such as d4, for example, let's say, and try to resolve the position that way, you know, white can go knight bd2 and a very typical plan will be to maneuver the knight around like this in order to attack the bishop and maybe get to f5 to have the knight in a very good position to attack the, uh, attack the black king side. Perhaps you remember Kaspar saying that a 9 f5 is worth a... What's the word? That a 9 f5 is worth a pawn. Well done if you remembered that one. So, in any case, rather than closing the tension or playing the computer's idea of taking f3 and then playing d4, which strikes me as a bit of an odd decision, I think even though the computer says equal, I think that most human players would much prefer to be white. Because, I mean, you've got this very strong bishop. You've got the bishop pair. And okay, black does have moves like knight a5 and h6 to try to kick the bishops back. That's the computer's idea for the play, but okay, it's not the most natural move for a human, yeah? So black goes d4 and tries to resolve the problems that Karawana set by releasing the tension. But now to h6, I think that you are never going to guess the move that Karawana played at this point. That's the hint I'm going to give you in case you want to try and get it right. So at this point, Caruana could have just played a move such as bishop h4 and kept the pin, but he didn't do that because after knight d7, black is able to trade off the bad bishop for white's good bishop, or at least one of the good bishops. And if you try to keep the bishop, you can see that this pawn has had a brighting on granite, where it's a general principle in the e4, e5 openings, that the bishop is not really that great on g3 as a long-term piece uh, in these sort of symmetrical positions, yeah? And also bishop e7, well, black just very easily gets the knights to good squares and, well, equalize out any real trouble, yeah? Uh, so, so bishop h4 doesn't really have the desired effect, and, okay, to be fair, bishop f6 is quite an interesting alternative to the game, where, yeah, you give up the bishop pair, but you've got this knight that arguably is more useful than their bishop, and, you know, you can try to maneuver the knight to the d5 square that's often a weakness for black in these structures, but I think that Caruana maybe didn't play this way because he realized that after knight a5 that black would be in time to play c6 and stop the knight coming in. And black is just very solid. I mean, it is true that bishop is a little bit offside on h5 and in a position such as after, let's say, g4. I know it looks very weakening to push pawn front of king, but the position is closed so we can get away with it. I mean, if this bishop was on a square like e6, it would be completely equal, but uh, it or even maybe a tad better for black. But because the bishop is misplaced on g6, white has a tiny edge. But, I mean, one problem is not enough to win the game. Yeah, so it's sort of going to still be quite close to balanced if black just develops normally, right? In any case, the move that Caruana played, and you might have figured out by a process of elimination by now, is the move bishop to c1. And that shows you just how deep Caruana's preparation was for this game, where he realized that he has the idea of playing bishop d2. Then the bishop goes to g5. And then the bishop goes back to c1. So that means Caruana has given up a total of three tempi. That's right. Three tempi 
in order to get the black bishop on a bad square on h5. The thing is, he also can't get out of it, yeah? The bishop can't just teleport back to e6 and everything is all honky-dory as such. So an incredibly deep uh, strategic understanding by Karawada, and I think you'd agree that it would be nearly impossible to come up with this move on your own, but that's the power of having the Grandmaster preparation to help you out. So in the game, black goes bishop to g6, and okay, I think I will cover the rest of the game a bit more briefly because, well, it's my natural tendency to talk about all of the fine details so that even, you know, Magnus, even, you know, uh, a beginner would understand every little point, and even Magnus Carlsen would learn something new from the video. But still, I think we should quickly see how the position played out just to, to give you a general idea. Of course, some of these moves by Black are not necessarily the strongest, but still, like, putting the 9a4 is a, a natural-looking idea, yeah? But unfortunately, it's just not that great in this position, because White will just take, and then even something like Rook AD1 is, is just very unpleasant, yeah? You get this super strong initiative in the center. And after queen c8, even a move like queen d2, just attacking the weak pawn is very, very difficult for black to deal with. You know, if bishop d6, you got e5 to kick that bishop out of the way, and on g5, the bishop just looks kind of ridiculous, yeah? It's saying become part of the pawn structure, even. So instead of that, black plays bishop c5, which is, I think, the right move in the position. Uh, and yeah, now comes a kind of interesting moment, because actually... Caruana played very prophylactically with g3, just not wanting to give the knight a square. I do think it would be very interesting to play g4 here and say, well, knight f4, I still can have a good version of this structure with similar ideas to before. You know where the f4 pawn is kind of weak, and you can even maybe consider a move like e5, potentially. Oh, rook a d1 and then e5 ideas. And, you know, with moves like e6, you can try to open up the king and say that even though your pawn moved in front of king, you're the one with the light squared initiative. That would be a very interesting idea and maybe even better than the game, but... Well, if you found this move, then well done, you did even better than Fabi. But G3 is still, of course, keeping a very nice advantage and leaving Black for any really constructive ideas. In fact, the best bet is probably to admit that Knight H5 was a bit imprecise and just put the Knight back on its good square on here. Because also, White doesn't have Knight G3, yeah? So, there was some value at least to provoking this G3 move by Black and prompting Bishop C2. I mean, probably the plan will be g4, knight g3, and try to go for some g5 attack, but black is not dead, let's put it like this. The game instead saw king h7, and I've mentioned many times before in my videos, those of you who watch a lot of them will know that one of the hardest things to do in chess is to admit... What's the word? To admit a mistake, exactly. And with king g2, we see that black is just stubbornly refusing to play knight f6, and unfortunately that is what cost him the game in the end. Move bishop c2 is a very beautiful move. There are many ideas behind it. First is you've got b4 and you can now start to kick the bishop and play on the queen side. Reminding black that he does have a weak pawn on b5, yeah? And the second point of bishop c2 is that you just make sure that black is not going to get counterplay of a move like f5. Because then you just take and, well, and probably just winning by force actually. Take, take and, you know, good old pinning and winning. Queen to e4, pins this, hits this, and if you try to defend both, then g4. And, well, look at all the forks and the pins. It's tactic of loser. But the game saw rook fd8, a more solid move by Aronian. And then white played b4, another great move to kick that bishop, bishop b6. And when you say a, you must say b. So a4. Well, I guess we're saying b and then saying a, but you got the idea. Black goes knight to f6 finally, realizing that the knight is completely useless on that h5 square when the pawn is on g3. And now we have an interesting question of what is the right way to convert the advantage. It's one thing to get the great position, but how do you actually win it? Well, that's why I show you the full games and don't just say why is much better and went on to win. So Caruana played the move knight h4, which is a very natural decision in the position just saying, well... Your bishop is bad, and I can either take it or put an R on f5 to advance my position. Uh, Carolina made a very interesting point that he didn't want to play the move a takes b5 and grab the pawn, because maybe this was a question that you were thinking, can't white just win a free pawn? And yeah, white does win some material, but it's not quite that simple. After bishop takes f2, queen c6. I mean, to be fair, white is definitely much better. You know, the two... 
the Bishop and the Knight are definitely a lot better than the Rook in this position. But we also see that the White King is a bit exposed, and maybe that gives Black some small chances to swindle the game. So that's why Caruana didn't go for it, I guess. But it's not a bad move either if you want to play that way. Uh, there's also the option of playing g4 and just building up an attack more gradually. That's the move that would appeal to me to kind of get my Nyon F1 into the game. Following the famous Mark Varetsky principle, a Soviet chess secret of improve the worst place, the worst place piece, exactly. So in the game, white goes knight h4, still keeping a very solid and stable advantage. Queen e6 is played. Uh, bishop to d3, just piling up the pressure on this pawn. Computer is saying that f4 and going for f5 is really good, but I think that's not an easy decision to make without a very large dose of courage or maybe liquid luck from Harry Potter. But the game saw bishop d3 instead, and okay, the move bishop h5 was played in the game, trying to, you know, provoke some sort of weakening pawn move, but turns out g4 is actually not that weakening. Although it does lead to some messy play here, it is kind of important to calculate well, yeah? Because Aronian realizing if he just plays some normal move like bishop g6, well, he loses a pawn for no compensation, and Kawana is strong enough to win with a pawn up, yeah? But he goes bishop g4 instead, Aronian trying to complicate the position a bit with knight takes g4 and say, well, your king is a bit exposed and I'm threatening f2. But Caruana found exactly the right move. And, and by the way, it's very important that you find exactly the right continuation as white or black would be right back in the game. So put those thinking caps on and let me know in the comments below what is the move that you would play here as white. And if you need a little bit of a hint, I would maybe suggest that you go beyond the assumption of thinking, I have to defend to get the F2 pawn, and maybe consider a more aggressive way to play the position, yeah? So, to get to follow up to that point, if white were to play a move like knight to e3, for example, that actually would be a mistake, because of takes, bishop takes, and then bishop takes e3, and the problem for white is that if you play queen e3, then there's queen g4, and you actually can't save the knight. Because if you go queen g3 to defend it, then it's your bishop that then falls after rook takes d3 on the on the next turn, yep. Yeah? So you don't want to do that. Uh, bishop e3 is actually not a bad alternative to the move that Kawana played in the game. But it's not quite as good because after knight takes e3 and f takes e3, because knight e3, bishop e3 transposed to the previous line, yep. Yeah? But here black has a little trick that keeps him in the game. And well done, by the way, if you saw this from afar. The answer is that the move rook d3 is available. With well, the point being that after queen takes d3 and queen g4, that black is able to win a knight, so that after this, black is actually not really behind on material. He's got the bishop and two pawns for the exchange. To be fair, this is probably still very strong for white anyway. A move like a5 is very annoying, for example, kind of putting the bishop in prison on a7. You know, probably you are winning with rook ad1, but... But it's not so easy. I think the way that Caruana won was a lot more convincing. What Fabi did is he played the move knight to f5 with the idea that, well, the knight is under threat, so knight takes f2 was Levon's choice. White goes bishop c2, the deadly quiet move. And, and what you might notice here is that the knight looks very annoying on f2, but, you know, you can't teleport over the, the knight like this here, yeah? And queen g3 is just nothing because knight g3 and, well, what's your follow-up check, bro? So black goes for the move g6 instead, and Caruana, actually he missed a bit of a faster win according to my the analysis of the engine, but I think that, well, in the game he probably should play knight e to 5 to e3, and kind of say, well, okay, your knight has to go to, to h3 to stay alive, but then, you know, knight d5 stops the knight f4 idea, and, you know, white is up a piece at the end of the day. It's sometimes just that simple. I'm up a piece, so I win. But instead... Uh, well, actually, maybe it's worth explaining a little more deeply that if black does play knight g1 trying to harass the queen, then it is kind of important that after knight e7 that you find this next move for white, because otherwise it might be a little bit tricky. But it turns out that, well, you could play a move like a5, for example, or even also quite interesting to play a move like queen g3, where the engine quite uh, bluntly points out that you can actually give back a fourth pawn for the piece, because after bishop e4, the point is that this knight is so out of play that you're actually almost up two pieces in the way, yeah? And if they go with, like, queen to c4, trying to, you know, stop bishop e3, 
you know, and winning the knight because, you know, obviously you want to keep the the e4 bishop defended, which obviously is not the case in uh, in this situation. But instead, white has to move queen h4 in it. And the computer points out that with, you know, this attack on h6 and the fact that, you know, h5 you can take anyway because of the pin, uh, it just ends up being winning for white. Just a decisive attack. But to be fair, not the easiest thing to see in actual game because keep in mind we're already at move... 35 in our analysis and this was move 29 so that's seeing like seven moves ahead as such but a move knight 1e3 does actually give black a chance to get back in the game and after g takes f5 e takes f5 even though white is winning you know the piece back and is well basically up a piece for two pawns the difference is now black has got this open g file that is quite scary and admittedly in the game and this is a point which basically, in some extent, decided the candidates, you could say. Oh, well, one of the games at least to decide the candidates. Because if black finds exactly the right a way to attack, and it is a little bit of a difficult computer line, then black saves the draw. If he doesn't, then he basically loses. And as you probably guessed, Aronian in time pressure did not find the answer. The key move for black here is not rook g8, because king h3, and you just don't really have a good follow up check in that case, yeah? Uh, but. Instead, the idea is that you can play this incredible move, knight takes b4. And the idea is that you sacrifice a knight that's not in the attack, so that you have the move rook to d4. And the ideas include things like, you know, playing rook to f4, and also rook g8, and we see those rooks are really flooding in the attack, in a way that didn't really happen in the rook g8 line earlier, yes or yes. And here after this, actually, white, uh... Well, actually, I've already said he didn't even see this idea during the game, it just didn't occur to him. And at this point, I mean, White already, I think, has to walk a bit of a tightrope to survive the attack. Girls also moves like Queen G5, even though maybe threatening to win back some material. So, anyway, you can explore this if you want. I think that once you see Rook D1, it becomes clear that you have to play this as Black, because everything else is just losing. Like, even if this attack was not working for Black, which it turns out it is uh, working for Black, but even if it wasn't, this would still be the right practical decision to give up the second piece, but keep your attack burning against the King. But instead, black played the move e4. And unfortunately, e4 just is not enough here. Uh, with the move rook h1, Fabi just kept the attack on this pawn. With ideas like knight g4 in the mix, maybe. Rook d6 is played to defend, but bishop takes e4, grabbing the pawn. Rook g8, king f1, and I mean, white is just up a piece, and it's just a matter of not getting uh, dirty flagged here. So knight to e5, queen to f4, just keeping that pressure. C6, A takes B5, opening up the rook here. And after the move, rook G5, a final sort of Hail Mary. We had B takes A6, queen to D8. And you know, now it's just a matter of keeping your sense of danger, just making sure you don't allow any counterplay. I mean, a move like king E2 would be quite practical, not just allowing it, just not allowing any attack on the D file with the queen and rook. But Caruana took the forcing route and played the move F6 here. And then after Black's move, knight to g6, a very nice little petite combinaison with the move, rook takes h6. And Aronian resigned in this position. So why exactly did he resign? Well, the reason is that obviously king g8, rook takes g5 is just, you know, not, not enough for Black yet. But if you play king h6 instead, then white can play... The move of... Well, there's actually many winning moves to be fair, but the most clinical is knight g4. King h7 takes, and you're basically going to mate at some point with queen h6, queen g8. Because if rook d1, it might look scary, but after king to e2, there's actually no good checks for black. Because these squares are covered by the bishops, and you know, knight f4 is obviously pinned. And you could take it even if it wasn't. So, a very nice win by Caruana, and I realise that we spent quite a lot of time... Going through this game, but I think you'll agree that this was one of the most exciting games of the tournament. And a lot of very deep ideas I think even Grandmasters can learn from. At least I know I definitely learned something from this game. However, there is one other game I do want to share with you, which shows, let's say, the main line of Bishop D2. And this will ensure that you really are fully prepared for this, uh, for this variation. So, if we go to our next game, as I just fast forward... This game was played one year later between uh, a top Indian Grandmaster, Pantala Hare Krishna, uh, against uh, Ding Liren in the Shenzhen Cup of 2019, obviously featuring the, you know, the same starting moves that we saw before. So the first 10 same moves, Bishop A4, Knight F6, Castles, and, you know, you kind of see this point that 
when we defend our e-pawn, we are threatening to take their e-pawn. And that's the reason why black is sort of compelled to play b5 to deal with the pressure against the knight. So bishop b3 castles, d3, d6, bishop d2. So we already talked about these ideas, but after bishop to g4 and c3, what do you think is the best move for black to play in this position? And give you a hint, it's not the move d5 that, uh, that Aronian played in the previous game. Well, in a game, Ding Liren, you know, obviously had seen this Kawana Aronian game we just looked at, and he had prepared the move knight a5 as a rather logical improvement, using the fact that c3 does uh, mean that the bishop's not covering that square anymore. So bishop c2, c5, all very standard. But now after a3, well, we have this interesting question of, well, what should black do? Should he take the knight? Should he retreat? Or should he... And keep the pin, or should he try to move the bishop back this way, for example? What are your thoughts on the position? Well, in this case, Ding went for the move bishop to h5, which I think is probably the best move. I know that I mentioned before that, uh, you know, that black, white is very happy in the royal appears to have the bishop on h5, because then we can kick it around and ends up being quite misplaced on g6 in many cases. But the thing is that if you don't play this, you kind of... Uh, how to say, like, you can't get a worse version of some other types of positions. Like, let's say, if you play bishop e6, which would be a very good square for the bishop, by the way, if the center was stable. But it turns out you have the move d4. And later on, you're going to have a d5 move to gain a tempo on that bishop later at some stage. And that's going to give white a pretty nice advantage. You have knight c4, well, who cares? Just bishop c1. And you get that time back by kicking the knight away with b3 later, yeah? So that would give white a nice advantage. And actually, this is how a game uh, between Ganguly against Anand went in Kolkata 2018. Okay, Anand played Queen C7 and went on to win the game, but not because of the opening. You know, definitely Ganguly did have a very nice edge out of the opening, playing for B3 and D5. But okay, Anand is a very strong player, so, you know, it is what it is. So, in any case, uh, and if Bishop D7 also, the point is that... Uh, well, even here, d4 is playable, but it's maybe a bit less effective when you're not getting a tempo on their bishop, yeah? So the idea is more to play bishop e3 and say, okay, my bishop is not great on d2, but, you know, I give back the tempo that you gave me when you brought the bishop to g4 and then d7. And I think that with some plan like knight bd2 and just some rook c1, d4, maybe bring the knight around typical Lopez style to g3 to support the center and play on the king's side, yeah, White's just got a more harmonious position here because of the fact that the 9a5 is a little bit misplaced on the edge of the board, yeah? But if you go knight c6, well, even then, like, d4, d5, still you're kicking the knight around like a soccer ball. And that is really the reason why White is just a little bit better in a position like this uh, with d4. So that's why I think the bishop a5 is quite an important move if you want to try to equalize, but it's not maybe the most natural for an advanced player to play who has studied these Lopez positions in a lot of detail. But let me ask you this. What is the key move for White to play in this position? It's not an easy move to see, but I'll give you a hint that Caruana played this move in the previous game as well. In a different position, but you have seen this idea before, yeah? You know, there's a leaf blower sort of blowing in the, in the background, like saying, you know, the position is too quiet, let's bring some life and some noise to the party. But actually the key move here is Bishop to c1. Yeah, I know it looks very crazy, but if you think about it, the bishop is kind of better on this square than it is on any of these other squares, paradoxically. And that's a point I, I'm happy to explain to you, that if white does play bishop g5, well, if you think about it, black is kind of wanting to trade off this bad bishop anyway, yeah? So, something like h6. If you play bishop h4, then black is just going to trade off the bishops with something like knight 2 h7, and, you know, these are kind of useful moves anyway, like, bishop g3, knight g5 kind of is not what white really wants in this sort of position, and, you know, here, black trading as bad bishop also would give him an advantage with the extra space, and different, uh, breaks at his disposal, like, you know, f5 or d5 at some point, which is sort of what black typically is aiming for, especially d5. So, bishop g5 doesn't really cut the mustard, but if you put a bishop on e3 here, okay, it's true, I recommended this in the in a position where the bishop was retreating. But here the difference is that the knight is pinned, yeah? So that means black has an extra possibility that he didn't have when the bishop was, say, on d7 or e6. And that is the move of d5. 
using the fact that there's no knight takes e5 because of this, and if you play knight d2, we see now why the bishop is misplaced d4, and, you know, suddenly that bishop is getting kicked to g5, which, as we already saw, is not really the square you want to go to as white, yeah? So, and yeah, if you play g4 trying to win a pawn, that's also very, very risky. It turns out you can actually sacrifice a piece even with knight takes g4 as black. And yeah, you're down a piece, but, you know, how is white getting out of this pin? Black's ready to go f5 and e4, and it's just very, very bad for white this position. I mean, you're not losing a piece by force because of e d5, but it's just a very strong attack, like queen d5, rook f6, and look at this king, it's just completely nude uh, in this position. Well, you could say, like, d f4, which are, like, they only got the tunic, like, nothing else. But anyway, that's why the move bishop c1 is quite important, because it means that now, if black were to play d5, well, what is the difference? The difference is that now you can play e takes d5, and have that pressure against the pawn that obviously we wouldn't have if that bishop was still on uh, on uh, e3, as it were. And you know now g4 is a much more serious idea. Now that you've got like knight d2 and you know to cover the the pin if they if they take and such. I realize I'm drawing a lot of arrows, but if I just showed you every single move, you wouldn't improve your visualization. I like to make you think a little bit, try to put it in your head, because that will make it much easier to calculate the variations when you get them in a the game. Yes or yes. So, d5 is not really that great of a move in this position, and the reason why Ding played knight c6 is to try to prepare d5 by defending the pawn. Sound good? Well, I think that the better move probably is to play h6 at this point. Because h6 is almost always a useful move in these positions, yeah? Where, you know, you're ready to go rook e8, bishop f8, and defend the pawn prepared d5. And I think that, you know, to be completely objective, a position like after knight to d2... If black plays a very precise move, knight h7. Uh, before I talk about knight 7 actually I want to point out that black, if he plays the rook e8 idea that I mentioned, which I assumed was the idea of h6, well, I mean, white can go knight f1, and I think that you can make an argument that some position like this, if white, let's say, either goes knight to e3 and, you know, plays maybe this sort of plan of knight g4 to, uh, you know, to try to, to get this d5 square, Probably the position is still equal, because black does have d5, and he can, you know, push in the center before we get in knight g4 and the domination of the d5 square, which is white's absolute dream in this kind of d3 structure. I mean, still, you can go knight hg4, and I do think that this position, although it did end in a draw in a, uh, in a, a computer game, I think that you can really make the argument that something like, let's say, hg4, uh, which I think I like better than queen takes g4, just improve the structure a little bit. I think you can make an argument the position is easier to play for white because there's a strong outpost knight on d5, but computers have a way of spoiling all our fun and says, well, you can play like f6 and reroute the bishop at some point and, you know, black can hold. But that's opening fury for you, even if you play the best moves as white. If they play the best moves as black, they're able to very gradually equalize. But there is an alternative plan as well for those who want something a little more spicy, a little more dynamic. Well, the attacking move is g4. And g4, well, obviously very double-edged, and, you know, after something like rook to b8, which is trying to prepare queenside can't play with b4, but, okay, you can play, for example, knight to g3, or king to g2, and, you know, there are these moves to kind of build up the attack, and, well, it's a very sharp position, but one way I do like white's chance and would give white a very small edge in this position as well. Perhaps the edge is more of a practical one than a purely objective one, but I am quite confident in white's chances and would be very much happy to play this in a game with white, even against the top GM. So, so that's kind of why rook e8, I think, does give white a little bit of a pull. But I think that knight h7 is a much more effective approach. That, you know, if you're playing Magnus Carlsen, probably this is something along the lines of what he goes for against this. And after knight f1, black's idea of knight 7 is to play to move... Say it with me. Knight to g5, using the pin on the knights. And okay, it's kind of an annoying pin. You know, you'll play bishop takes g5, bishop g5. And now the idea is to go g4 and say that the, you know, that their bishop is kind of bad on g6. But yeah, I mean, this position I think is ultimately quite okay for black. You know, computer is saying that white has some very small edge with knight to e3 and, you know, going queen f3. But to be fair, I think that because white's king is a little bit open and black man should trade off some pieces. Along with the fact you've got moves like, let's say... For example, rook a, b, a, and going for b4. I feel like it's a sort of slightly worse position that black can hold without that much trouble, but maybe I'm also giving black too much credit. Maybe the engine is right in saying plus 0 0.43, and I just, you know, I'm being too generous, but, you know, 
in any case, it's pretty clear that White's position is more pleasant. Yeah, you've got the ideas to push you on the king's side, and, you know, you've got all the breaks, whereas Black's play with b4 does strike me as being a little bit slower by comparison. So that's kind of where things stand with this line, and sort of shows that, yeah, Black has not really figured out a 100% clear equalizer, where the lines are recommended by the, the engines and played by the top engines are not necessarily giving the clear equality. Well, perhaps I should point out for the sake of objectivity that the best move, like, according to modern engines, is to go queen c7. And then after knight d2 to play it with uh, rook a d8 and try to get a d5 break. And, you know, maybe this is the way to maintain the balance to just develop all the pieces out like this. You know, knight g3, you can meet with bishop g6. And, and okay, why there's different ideas like queen e2, knight h4. But in all the cases, black is in time to go d5, hit the center. Maybe go c4 to open it up. And, you know, black is definitely not worse when he's got such harmonious development like this only bad piece of bishop on g6 but everything else is playing its part yeah so that's probably the way that black should equalize but it's not a move that has been played in well it's been played in some games actually in engine games where sometimes like with the opening book on chess space you can only see a few of the moves and you have to click to to see the other ones so that that, that explains it but anyway rather than playing with the equalizing queen c7 ding played knight c6 which does turn out to be somewhat imprecise and after knight b to d2, black plays the move d5, trying to push in the center and, you know, have all these, these pawns side by side to give the structure the maximum flexibility. To which white just plays knight f1, just continuing to maneuver. And probably the move that black should maybe consider is definitely a move like d4. It's one that, you know, the engines often want to play to get a big space advantage. But then the structure is almost a bit like a king's Indian, but one where the bishop is not so great here. And I think that in a position like this, you know, if they play bishop g6, I think that you can make an argument that with bishop b3 that, you know, white's piece are quite active, that, you know, your knight can come to a5 in some cases, you can prepare an f4 break one day. And white does sort of have different ways to kind of chip away at black's position. Black has a space, but it's not so clear how he makes use of it, yeah? Uh, maybe it's better for black to play bishop f3, but again, not a very natural decision, you know, to give white the unopposed strong bishop. And also after g6, you stop knight f5, but you allow bishop h6, so you're not really getting away scot-free as black in this position after bishop b3. I think you could make an argument that white's somewhat better here, at least on a practical level, if nothing else. But instead of that, black plays d4, again, ding playing more solidly, just trying to sort of equalize. But I think that in this ending after queen takes and bishop d1, I don't feel like black is fully equalized in this position. And the reason for that is because of some very subtle factors, such as that the knight on c6 is kind of stuck. Uh, or as a guy drew a million arrows, so I didn't even have to draw the painting, he just drew it for me. But there is, you know, knight c6 is stuck between the e5 pawn, yeah? And the bishop on h5 also is not really so well placed. So black struggles a little bit to find a good sort of harmony of the pieces, and that's why I think that instead of the move rook fd8 that Ding played in the game, which I think is a little bit imprecise in retrospect. Okay, it's a very natural move, but I think that it's better to play the move c4. And actually, this is sort of Black's dream in these positions, is to get the knight to d3, where it's an absolute monster piece. Of course, White gets moves as well, and he can deal with it, but I think it's pretty clear that this is the direction that Black should go to avoid the kind of way he gets ground down in the game. And I will try to cover this game a lot more briefly than the previous one, in terms of the ending, because this is a Pretty long, you know, 70... Yeah, 79 move game, actually. So let's just quickly see how it played out. Um, Probably bishop g6 is where it really starts to go bad for black. I mean, if you give up the bishop pair. And play g6, I mean, you're probably only slightly worse here. You know, white has the bishops, but the knight is a little bit silly. And okay, white will try to put knight on d5, but black can trade it and it's not the end of the world as such. But bishop g6, well, now white just gets a lot of good things happening, like knight f5 would be quite strong, but the game instead saw knight to, uh, to h4 trying to get in that way. Uh, but that also allows black to play knight d7, which, yeah, is probably a good move in this position to, because if white takes, yeah, you get the bishop pair, but black also improved his structure a little bit by, you know, stopping our knights and making look for the king with tempo. It's kind of a funny point about the doubled pawns, yeah, that you, when the doubled pawns are kind of on the, on the G file or on the B file like this, when you're a capture of rook's pawn toward the center, it actually improves the structure most of the time. So a good little point to keep in mind. And okay, white plays the move 
knight g to f5, trying to get the bishop pair in a better version. Say bishop takes... Well, then, I mean, it's a better version of the structure, yeah, because, you know, if they go g6, you've got, like, h6 for the knight, and you can try to probe this way, or even go back to d5 is probably even better, because that is a pretty juicy outpost for black in these trigger and structures, which, you know, if you've played a lot of Bobby Fischer games, you probably are familiar with this sort of thing. So, black plays to move bishop to f8 instead. White plays to move b3. Uh, b3 actually is a slightly curious move to me, and he just didn't want to allow c4 and a knight coming in as c3, but I do think that you could also definitely make an argument for something like, uh, for example, knight takes g6, knight e3, and saying that your knight on d5 is going to be better than their knight on d3 at the end of the day. So... The game is set to b3, trying to keep more control, just not allowing the c4 plan quite so easily. But it does have other trade-offs that, for example, I mean, black could even play c4 anyway if he wants to, but I kind of like the idea of playing a move such as a5, or maybe take the knight first and then play a5. Because then you're using the disadvantage of b3 that you've created a potential hook for black to try to latch onto. I mean, even a move like b4 is kind of interesting in a position like this, with the idea that you're going to trade and give a very nice outpost for knight on d4 that kind of compensates the fact that white has an outpost for knight on d5, yeah? And that would probably come close to keeping the balance, in my humble opinion. So instead of that, we had the move b4, and I think in this version it's maybe a bit less precise, perhaps, but... Okay, white well, didn't play cb4 and, you know, keep the tension... and kind of release tension that way. He went bishop b2, and, well, now... This c4 was a really nice idea, which is kind of the reason why I recommended playing c takes b4 a bit earlier, so that way you don't have the whole c4 idea to break through. You know, the point is that after b takes c4, black has this knight c5 move, and suddenly, you know, it's not so easy to avoid moves like knight d3 forking the bishop and rook. Because if you go bishop c2, which, by the way, is actually what happened in the game, then black goes rook d2, and actually, if anything, it's black who is the one who is starting to get the play in this position. No objective, it is still equal, and I'm going to fast forward a little bit just to kind of get to the more critical moment, but I think at this point we can say that admittedly White did not perhaps handle this uh, this sort of early endgame in the very best way, and so Black has managed to get very full activity and compensation for the pawn, yes or yes. Well, the game continued with King to F1, which is a very important move, by the way, to be able to have Rookie 2 ready to... to fight for the control of the second rank. So, black goes to a5, and yeah, a5, I'm not so sure if this was the very best way. You know, maybe one very interesting tactical idea if black just wanted to equalize would be to play a move like b3. I mean, my first one was to play knight d3 and just trade the bishops like this and, and just say that black is fine, but if you play b3, it's kind of a fancier way of using the pin on the bishops. You know, we'd take Take it, I mean, in this way, you basically can force the opposite colored bishops, which have, of course, a more drawish tendency. And, you know, when black has got the better bishop than white and can sort of get back to the pawn, it's pretty clear that at the worst case, black is going to draw this and maybe can even play for a win with some rook d2 ideas if white is not precise. <gasps> and, of course, the outside pass pawn, a nice little added bonus for black as well. But Black instead played the move a5, a much more slow approach, maybe trying to go a4 then b3 or something, but then White goes knight e3 and sort of defends the bishop in time, yeah? So knight d3, bishop takes, and and yeah, in the game, Black decided to do it this way with rook takes b2 and get the opposite card bishop ending in this version. But White now found a very good move to get out of it, and this is quite an important move, by the way. If you don't see this, Black will just play like rook takes d3 or rook takes a2, and have a pretty big advantage. But well done if you spotted the following move. And I guess you can pause the video if you need more time to find it. But rook e2 is the key. We counterattack the rook. And if they take, we take back and defend the bishop in the process. Yeah? This way or, or this way. So that's actually what happened. Black played rook e2. Bishop e2. And okay, black plays rook d2 at this point. Um, actually, I think that maybe bishop c5 is more precise. Because in some positions, it might be a good idea to trade that knight so that you can bring the rook to d2 a bit more easily. And also maybe have a good knight versus bad bishop position sometimes. Or even, you know, just keep the bishop blocking the white's past c pawn, yeah? Well, black goes rook to d2 in this position. White plays c takes b4. And now after bishop takes b4, which probably is a mistake, by the way. I think a b4 will be a 
a better reason for reasons that will become clear in the game. Because, I mean, White probably has to go Rook C2 if he wants to really play for for an advantage. But the thing is, like, opposite card bishops just have such a drawish tendency. And, okay, with the knights on the board, there are some chances to play for a win. Like, if the... Actually, bishop C5 is not so good because the knight would end attack with tempo and that would be quite bad. But, you know, black can play it a little differently with something like, let's say, knight A5. And, okay, with this sort of blockade on this or the possibility of trade pawns... It's suffering, but black should be able to draw it with correct play once some more pawns get traded. Just keeping our blockade on the dark squares. True or true. So instead we had bishop b4, and this is really the kind of turning point of the game. And again, this sort of shows why I like to show you the full game, not just to show you the opening phase of, okay, you got the advantage, now go and fend for yourself. But show, okay, this is how the position plays out, and this is how you can outplay the opponent. Or there's some FMAC endgame ideas even that come up from some of the typical positions. So what would be your move as white to deal with the idea of rook takes a2 by black? Yeah, I'm drinking a lot of water because it's a grandmaster performance tip to keep yourself hydrated to play your best chess. And also stops me losing my voice, which is nice. So the key is to play the move c5 and pretty much any other move like they'll either take or, you know, something like rook c2 we can't really saw. How those sort of endings are just very fine, very safe for black, yeah, despite the pawn deficit. But c5 now we're getting our past pawn moving, and so much of opposite card bishop position is all about taking the initiative. And the point is if black does take that pawn, which is not what happened in the game, but to help you understand why black didn't play this, it's because bishop c4. Uh, bishop b5 is, might look more natural, but then the problem is after the knight moves, let's say, to d4, then, you know... You're counter-attacking the bishop and, you know, you're not in time to actually queen the pawn. Because black is going to sack the knight for the pawn when you get here, yeah? So, it's important to go the other way. Bishop c4 and then bishop to d5. And that allows you to push the pawn forward without your bishop being a target. And in fact, in this position, white is basically just winning. Because it's not just the past pawn, but even moves like knight c4 just forking here is actually winning material for white to boot. So, black is kind of just lost at this stage. So instead of this, black plays bishop a3, trying to disrupt this coordination by trying to get the rook off this file. But the problem is white can just move the rook away anyway. Uh, white played a move rook d1, which I don't really agree with this decision because it lets black kind of trade off the pieces and trade off the rooks. I think much better is to play to move rook to b1 instead. With the point being that if they play bishop c5, you have a very nice little switcheroo with a move rook c1. And I have to admit this is... A very difficult idea to see that we move the piece and then we move it right back to where it was. As I've said, that one of the hardest things to do in a chess game is to admit you made a mistake. But the point is that after bishop takes e3, because otherwise a piece is lost for free, we take back and, well, we see that the rook is a lot better. Or more precisely, the rook and bishop are a lot better than the rook and the knight, yeah? And if knight e7, well, you can play moves such as rook c7, because if the knight moves, rook c8 check is a pain, and if... King f8 and a4, and we see that the material might be equal now, but white is ready to meet rook a2 with bishop to b5 defending this pawn. And then meanwhile, white is going to pick off this pawn and be a very strong pass pawn ahead. Whether it's enough to win or not, I think is beside the point, because it's clear that this is the way to play and it gives white a very big advantage. Whereas in the other lines, like rook d1, white's advantage is comparatively smaller. After rook takes, bishop takes, bishop c5, well... It's still, the game is very instructive in the sense that, well, even in this position, it's still not that easy for Black to save it. He has to play some somewhat precise moves, and in the game, Ding ultimately did not come up with the best decision here. Uh, he played the move Bishop to d4, trying to defend this pawn, because the white idea is he's going to play Bishop a4, and the knight is not going to be able to keep those pawns defended, and of course the Black Bishop cannot just teleport to c7, which would make it a dead draw, but he has to choose which pawn to give up. It's kind of like, you know, choosing between... You know, do I, who do I want to save? My mum or my dad? Like, how do you make this choice? But, uh, in any case, the move that probably Black should play is the move G5, which, it looks a bit weird, but the idea is you're kind of grabbing some space, and, you know, it's not so bad. Now, after Bishop A4, well, you go Knight B4, and, okay, White can try to take a pawn, but it's not so easy all of a sudden, you know. If they take A5, well, we can take Knight takes F2, or even Bishop A3 is actually even better. And if they go bishop c2 first, well, okay, white manages to exchange the pawns, and yeah, you got a pass pawn. 
But now we see it a very deep point behind this G5 move that now you can actually play G4 and kind of trade off the pawns to get your knight into play. And, well, general principle is that the more pawns you get traded, the easiest for the worst side to draw. True or true. So that would be the way that black defends, but I think agree not the most natural continuation in the world. Though to be fair, there is also knight h4 that probably also defends, but it's not as, I guess, effective as some of the other ideas that black has, like g4 that we saw. But okay, the game instead saw bishop to d4, and now we get to see how Hare Krishna showed very good endgame technique to grind his opponent down. Because I do think that bishop d4 might already be a decisive mistake. And it shows just when you are saying a lot of problems, like a good benefit of having these opening weapons is not just that you get a very good chance to get an advantage out of the opening, but it's also that they have to spend a lot of time trying to solve the problems over the board, yeah? Because at the top level, the mistakes don't just happen in a vacuum. The blunders happen as a result of a lot of long-term sustained pressure. I mean, if you look at the Nepo Carlson match, for example, you'll notice that Nepo played a lot worse in the second half because he kind of had used so much, you know, mental energy working out the problems in the previous games, and then it meant he was not in the state to deal with those same problems and what, let's say, normally he would easily in a training session, but when you're playing like and having to solve tough problems day after day, then yeah, it gets harder. Or let's say minute after minute if we talk one game. So Bishop A4, this is a really great move, just removing the defender. And now we kind of see the difference that it makes when black doesn't have this pawn up. That after knight takes A5, well, if black plays knight takes F2 now, the difference is that white has this move bishop c2, and unfortunately it's a bit too late to play knight to h1 at this point, because white goes knight to c6, and okay, at this stage, you know, knight g3, well, so what? White has got the knight on the perfect position to shepherd that pawn to queening, and the end result is black is basically going to have to give up that bishop to avoid the loss, to avoid a white queening, but then white just wins easily, yes or yes. So knight c5 was black's play, but after bishop c6... Well, it's still a similar issue that black has a very hard time stopping the outside pass pawn. And you'll notice that after knight f8, king, knight c4, king e7, that the blacking has a very hard time actually getting to an active position, yeah? And also we see after f3, um, f3 wouldn't be my top choice. I think that probably it is a lot better to play like a4 and get that pass pawn as far as possible. To also try and tie up the knight in a, in a position like this. But okay, the move f3 was played. We had uh, king d8, king e2. And just out of interest, what do you think is the right square to move the bishop to here if you're white? Well, there are many playable moves, but bishop d5 is the most effective because now we are... Because, I mean, if you know your bishop and knight checkmate, you'll kind of know this concept, how the knight and bishop are sort of stopping the black king moving forward, creating a sort of little barricade or, you know, force field in a sense that the black king is not able to pass. The game continued f6. We had bishop g8. And this is sort of the more technical phase where we see... Black sort of saying, well, I have a fortress and you can't break through. Whereas I was going to say, well, let me keep improving my position and you can try to prove it. And we'll see who succeeds. Uh, well, h4 is a good technical move by white, where you want to play h5 and fix g7 as a weakness. Uh, the more direct approach would be to play knight e3 and to force the exchange of bishop for knight. But I think that Hare Krishna might have been concerned that this maybe is a fortress for black. That you can play like king b6, stop the pawn and white then doesn't really have a way through with the king when the king gets here. Um, of course, it requires a deeper analysis of the turn where it is actually a successful fortress, but the fact that the engine for evaluation is not going way up for white rapidly does suggest that maybe black is able to, to hold just by the very skin of his teeth. If white does have a win, I'd definitely be interested to know in the comments, but let's uh, let's see how the game played out with h4. Uh, and okay, knight b7 was black's move, trying to trade off the knights because... I mean, if the knights get traded, this is just an ironclad 100% dead draw. But, of course, white, uh, white is not going to oblige. Knight to d2 keeps those knights on the board. King b6. And now I really like this move by white. The move knight to b3. Just, again, building the barricade, not laying the black king to the fifth rank. Bishop c3, bishop to d5. And, okay, I think it's a position that if black defends correctly, if he plays... A move like g6 to not let his pawns get fixed. I think that black can probably still hold it. But it's definitely very, very close. But instead bishop b4. And I think that this maybe makes a difference between white winning and it being a draw. If not objective, at least on a practical level. We see how much harder it is for black to defend when he can't push the pawns. And is only able to use the pieces to defend. 
So bishop c3, king d3, black played bishop b1, and I mean, uh, well, Harakrishna's technique was just very, very good in this position. It had king to c2, so he's maneuvering that king toward the king side, toward the queen side, I should say. Maybe at this point, black has to try to change the position, maybe f5, and trying to trade off some of the pawns or to get your knight in is probably a better chance to hold, I think. But instead, we had bishop f2. Knight to c1 was played, f5. So he tried it in this version, but I think it's a lot less effective now that white is in time to go knight d3 and force the bishop to a bad square. That kind of means that white is going to be winning because the bishop is not able to defend this and also stop this pawn advancing, yeah? So f takes e4 was played. Bishop takes e4 is a very nice technical recapture. Realizing that if we had this trade happen, then the white knight is a million times better than the black bishop because of the black pawns being stuck on the same color complex. Whereas if you had, let's say, e6, g6, h7 instead of the structure, well, maybe black has some chance to save it. Probably it's still dead lost, but in principle, you want the pawns on opposite color to the bishop, yeah? So knight e8 was played, king b4, and okay, we see also bishop e4 is covered by the knight, yeah? So knight f6, a5, king a7, bishop g6 just defends the pawn, knight d5, and as you can see, I'm going for this pretty quickly, because we kind of... It's just a matter of mopping up and just making sure we finish him off. Uh, King c6 and just going after this pawn is probably the most clinical, but basically, Hara Krishna remembers the do not hurry principle from winning endgames from Michael, from Mikhail Sheroshevsky. And after knight d5, bishop e4, knight f6. Uh, yeah, very interesting move by White here to play knight to b4. I think that it is probably better to keep that pawn alive. You don't have to change your position right away. But it was... Uh, Hare Krishna's decision to do so. We had king to knight to c6, and it looks kind of counterintuitive, but I think if black goes knight king b7, and then let's say if knight takes e5, goes for king b8, I mean, I'm not so sure if white actually wins this. Because black has got actual counterplay with knight f7 here, and it's not so easy to actually queen the pawn when our bishop can sort of cover it with a king, yeah? So maybe this was black's chance to try to get back in the game, or at least to have some chances... Wow, those magpies are cackling really loudly. This is a joy of living in Australia. We have all the beautiful, you know, fauna, you know, all the different animals so we don't have anywhere else in the world. But anyway, you're always welcome to visit. But returning to the game, we had King to A8 here. And, uh, well, after this, we had... Well, actually, at this point, it kind of transposes, in fact, because here White probably should go A6 and just keep that King completely dominated. Maybe we could even imagine some crazy mating pattern, but maybe it's not so easy. But I think it should still be winning here for white. I guess my idea is maybe you can go like 97 f5 if the knight moves away and kind of go for a little fork. There are all these little tricks in the position. But okay, white play 95, take a pawn with check, but maybe not the best move. Because here I think if black plays correctly, he can draw this, but in the game, while well, he's been defending for so long that, you know, probably Ding was low on time, also a little fatigued, and this led to him making what I believe to be a decisive mistake in this position. Now, I know that you've been watching this for a while, you've been enjoying this Masterclass session, but what would be the move that you would play if you were black? Can you defend it better than the top Chinese player, Ding Li Ren? Actually, one thing I kind of realised, I actually have played both Hare Krishna and Ding in classical tournament games, which is yeah, quite a coincidence, but... Anyway, the key move is either to play... The moves can still be interchanged, but the idea is that you play... Bishop to f2, anticipating the idea of a6, a7. And then you play to move knight to f4. And the idea of this is that, well, if they go a7, then you just go king b7, I believe, and they just don't have a good discovered check, and you take the pawn and draw. And if they play a move like g3 in this position, or let's say g4, well, you just kind of sit on the position like bishop g1, and you basically just have a fortress, where white is not really able to get his piece around to actually queen the pawn, and... It looks kind of weird, but just white just doesn't have a way to advance the pawn. The king side is fully blockaded on the dark squares, and it just ends up being a fortress, let's say. But instead of that, Ding blundered with knight f6, and this meant that now, after a very important move by white, this move of knight to d4, while we're threatening this fork, we're threatening this fork, and black is not able to cover all of them at once, yeah? So black goes knight e8, trying to defend the pawn, but then a6, and our pawn is decisively advancing. Of course, in this position, a7 is a very serious threat to queen the pawn. So black goes bishop f2, trying to meet it with some tactics. Um, okay, black's idea is that you can meet a7 
with bishop takes d4, knight b5, and get the pawn back. Funny enough, even this is still actually winning for white after king e5. It turns out white's king is just too close to the pawns, or maybe more precisely, black's king is too far away. So white just takes both the pawns and wins, but... Okay, Harrod Christian didn't want to give even a glimmer of hope to black. And so in this position, he played the move king d5, which is also 100% winning here. Kind of with the same idea, yeah, that you just use the pawn as a sort of decoy, and meanwhile you just are collecting the harvest on the king's side, because you're a king up on this side of the board, yeah? So knight d7, king f7 was played, just not allowing a knight to c5 fork. Black goes g5, white takes the free pawn when knight takes h6, and after king b6, bishop b7, bishop e3, king e6, knight c5, king f5. It doesn't matter if they take the bishop or pawn, because you trade them bishop, your bishop for the knight, and then the, with the two extra pawns after knight f7, g5, well, the two extra pawns are easily enough to win with these connected passes, and so Ding resigned at this point. Okay, this was a very detailed analysis of both of these games, and certainly you've probably noticed if you have been following my channel for what I like to do these sort of more longer, deeper dives to really extract the full lessons, the full value from the from the games. But I think you agree it was a lot of fun to enjoy this, and certainly, well, if we go to this point, we can say from a theoretical perspective that against the Marshall Gambit, if I just go back, um, for some reason it's not letting me scroll to the, uh, the click on the move, but, you know, this is the fast replay of how the game went, and eventually we'll get back to the position that I have in mind. So yeah, there we go, we saw this Bishop D2, that this is my recommendation against the Marshall Gambit in this video, or more precisely to avoid the Marshall Gambit, and certainly Black has to be very precise in order to deal with it, where we saw that this was kind of the, you know, the key position theoretically, where if Black plays the right plan, like queen c7, preparing the d5 break, he does ultimately equalize. But if he doesn't find this move, I do believe that white gets a small advantage, and that it's quite a pleasant position to play, where black somehow really struggles to solve the problem of his bad bishop on h5 in these kind of structures. So that's about all for me. Do comment below with what was your favorite part of the video, and also, if you didn't already, do remember to hit that red subscribe button. And also, you can check out the suggested video and enjoy that for more Grandmaster Chess training. Alright guys, I'll see you in the next one. Get out of here.